Obut! Obut! Good afternoon, everyone. What a wonderful fall afternoon for us to be together. September 21st, the autumnal equinox here in Saanich. This afternoon, we have an opportunity to share reflections on the three railroads that went from Victoria to Sydney and on out to Deep Cove, one of them from three speakers who know a lot more about each of these railroads <laughs> than I certainly do. And I think that we will enjoy the presentations this afternoon. First, I'd like briefly to tell you that <clears throat> a couple of years ago, Grant Sheldrake, Peter Goddard, and myself were discussing the possibility of doing a program on these three railroads. One of the three railroads ran right through Grant's parents' home, the BNS. One of the railroads went by my home, the at the observatory, the interurban. And the third railroad was on the eastern part of our peninsula that was close to where Peter Goddard's family has lived. So it is to the memory of Grant Sheldry, who inspired this program, that we wish to dedicate this afternoon. So I'm going to show you four pictures from our past. The first of these is a picture of a train engine, and we're not sure whether it was on the CNN or the VNS out at Basin Bay. The second is a photo of a rail bed from the past that reminds us of what may have been before in that area. And that photo, I'm not sure exactly where that is in the peninsula. Maybe some of you can recognize it. The berm is still there. The trains are not. Our third slide is a yellow gate, which actually is a cross an old rail bed on our peninsula. For some, it's a yellow gate. But for others, it's an invitation. It is a beckoning to explore a vista from the past. A vista that wouldn't exist in our minds or our discoveries if it wasn't that the railroad bed is there. If you look at this picture, which we've titled The End of the Line, it actually may be the end of a line, and you can see up in the picture the pile of rocks that was the end. But what we see in this photo is that nature is reclaiming the land. And eventually we'll restore it. And eventually it will restore it. 
So suppose you find a yellow gate and you do go through it. You may find a scene like this. So ladies and gentlemen, before we get to our three speakers, I'd like to show you a brief clip of an oral history that my friend Grant Sheldry did in 2012. I was going to tell you about the bullfight we had at our house, and uh, my my folks bicker a lot, mostly about laundry, and uh, and I have already you've seen the clothesline bully there, and uh, the, that clothesline became in inoperative because my mom fell off the wash stand at the house end and um, so she made a lot of fuss about it and uh, but washing the clothes was one thing but the drying was a, a big problem and everybody in those days uh, you had the you had the wood stove in the kitchen and the wood stove did everything heated the house cooked the food and um, and dried the clothes on one of those pull-up racks and pretty well everybody had those pull-up racks and always made your clothes uh, smell like wood smoke and bacon and eggs but <laughs> nobody seemed to mind I guess you know uh, nobody ever mentioned you know you came to school you know how come you smell like wood smoke nobody ever said that <laughs> they really smelled the same <laughs> washing and, sound, and, uh, and my dad put up a clothesline for it, strung them amongst the apple trees uh, used old sash, uh, well, yeah, new sash cord, nice white sash cord, and he thought this would really make her satisfied after losing a, a clothesline that where she fell off the washstand, and uh, and uh, so when you hung a lot of clothes on the line and it swooped down a lot, you got a long two by four with a fork end in it, and push that in there, and that would hold the clothes up. And so we all went somewhere after this, and it was a nice spring morning, and. Uh, uh, the uh, apples were all in, in blossom, and uh, there was nice lush grass on, around the trees, I remember, and my dad had, uh, amongst the, uh, the cows were down in the lower field, but the bull was tethered near these apple trees, because uh, I think he'd moved them up there to get the lush grass. And uh, so wind came up, nobody was home, and the sheet started to flap, and the, the fork stick fell out. And then the bull saw the, the, the clothes, and you know the, the clothesline was the matador, and the, and the sheets were the thing called a muleta, which is the red flag, you know, wave. And uh, so we came home, and the, all the, the sheets and pillowcases were a muddy heap, covered with grass and apple blossoms, and the, and the bull is bull is pawing the ground. <laughs> on the sheets <laughs> and, uh, so was just and then this report card is interesting because we moved from Esquimo and uh, all the districts uh, I don't think there was school districts at that time Sylvia would know and uh, because they just crossed out the, my, where it said Esquimo Elementary and crossed out Marjorie Bird who was my teacher in grade 3 at Esquimo and Mr. Colvin signed his name and it became a Royal Oak Report, report card and uh, there's a uh, uh, today a, a well worn expression today about uh, healthcare and education as we all hear a lot about healthcare and education and uh, in at the end of the report it tells or suggests proper diet you know, you've already had uh, education but this is the healthcare part and, and it says that every child should be given plenty of milk, vegetables, cereals, eggs, fruit, and water. But it doesn't say anything about meat. <laughs> and uh, I always like to give credit where credit is due. We had this wonderful teacher called Mrs. Gillenspitz. A lot of you probably remember her. And this, one of the major awards I got in school was my 40 words a minute typing award. And uh, for a while I used to, and I don't know where the pin is now, but I sometimes, if we went to some function, I would wear it. It's a little white pin. 
and uh, people would uh, come up to me that didn't know me and they would say, uh, hmm, was that Order of Canada? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to quit wearing it. I, 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 I think my wife, if you wanted water, you had to go out to a well, and the well was usually dry. And if you if you knew how to get water out of the out of a twenty foot deep well on the end of a rope with a bucket, you, you know you got water. So, uh, uh, but my brother and I didn't complain because uh, lack of water didn't bother boys. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you learn how to keep out of her way if you ever cut yourself or got a major abrasion out on the soccer field. You just shut up about it because if you made a fuss and went into the office. She always poured iodine right into it. And uh, so you just kept quiet about that if you had you know, <laughs> you know, like this all the way home. And uh, we always had wild soccer games up in the upper field over there. And uh, you were never really sure who won, but uh, it was uh, a lot of the games just ended up in a free-for-all. <laughs> and, and, and one kid would always get the soccer ball and grab it. And get a chokehold on it, towards the end of the game, you remember who it was, <laughs> and he would get the ball, and that would be the end of the game, the bell would ring, and a lot of people would get the strap, and that was, you know, that was, easy. <laughs> that was sports day. So uh, how's the time, um, have, we got, have we got time for one more story? So that's just a small clip of a really wonderful oral history that Grant did. And if you'd like to see the rest of it, it's of course on our blog, along with about four dozen other oral histories that represent the memories of our families, who some of whom were pioneers in the Sandwich Peninsula. So now I'd like to introduce to you a friend of mine, Ron Burnham. And Ron grew up in Strawberry Vale, near the interurban, and went to Mount View High School. We were there together. And as a longtime resident of Sandwich, who has written some articles on the area, and has a deep understanding of the railroad, the Interurban Railroad, I'm delighted to introduce to you Ron Burnham. The Interurban has railway school, BC Electric Sandwich Line, or Interurban as we call it, was short, short in length, maybe 18 miles from downtown Victoria to its terminus at Deep Cove. It was also short in existence, carrying passengers and freight for about 10 years. Why such a short time? It would have seemed that during those years of the First World War and the five years after that, it was destined to become a railway with a bright and successful future. There were a lot of people interested in it before it was started. <coughs> the next one now. Here's the officials behind it all. One of the reasons for its failure was the era of a boom or bust time when taking chances meant getting rich. Luck was needed, of course, but most important for success was being in the right place. And Victoria, apparently, at the beginning of the 20th century, looked like the right place. The city and the adjacent Saanich Peninsula had become known far and wide as a lovely place with nice weather, a beautiful setting, much like Vancouver, but without the smog and the lousy weather. We were separate from the mainland but we had daily passenger ships coming and going with lots of employment in logging, sawmills, and fishing. 
not surprising in those years. The peninsula appeared to, to entrepreneurial investors to be ripe for development. And not surprising, it developed a land boom. This is where BC Electric comes in. BC Electric was founded in the late 1890s. At the time, its management showed great intuitive insight. For the following half a century, they had built and operated extensive streetcar systems in Victoria with rails reaching outside of the city boundaries, offering service to Mount, from Mount Tommy in Saanich to the docks in Esquimalt. Another of the management's good decisions was the creation of Victoria Gas, where, whose distribution network pretty well covered the same ground as a streetcar system. Coal gas was extracted from coal, stored in a huge tank adjacent to Government Street, before being piped to kitchen sto stoves everywhere. As a result, BC Electric had proved itself as an all-encompassing organization, providing clean electricity not only to its own streetcar's overhead power lines, but also to street lights and household light lighting. The company provided the electricity that powered it all. Electricity, efficient, portable, adaptable. Electricity, non-polluting, clean, well, not quite. Electri electricity is clean, making it usually isn't. Coal, for instance, is dirty even before it is burned to make the steam, to make the generators turn, to make the electricity, to light all those homes and businesses, to light those clusters of funny little lights down on Douglas Street. Incidentally, BC Electric's other power installation, their dam site at Jordan River, and their coal-fired generating station at Brentwood had polluting aspects. One is a, has now an aging dam that could wipe out a small village after a major earthquake, or a browning of the skies from smokestacks. Anyway, back to the land boom. Much of the peninsula was being divided up into subdivisions, streets and roads. Invitations to buy went out far and wide. Building lots were selling, often unseen by their buyers, for goodly sums as happens in land booms. Real estate on the peninsula was hot. BC Electric's managers responsible for the successful triple threat supplier of electrical power, street cars, piped in cooking gas, noticed that things were happening out on the peninsula, land-wise. Company officials wanted to get on the action to serve the peninsula where those land sales were booming. An extension to the streetcar railway out from Victoria's Douglas Street to Deep Cove made sense. Photo, please. That's the last spike being driven. And the next one, there's the spike. Unfortunately, another, neither land development nor railway ridership grew as expected. The land, sales, the land sales died and the anticipated housing boom died with it. Ridership on the rail was late. Less than 15 years had elapsed before, between dreaming up the idea to build the railway and its untimely death. It pretty well lost money for its whole operation. Hard news for a company that had, up to then, seemed unable to make poor decisions. More about the land boom. The story of the peninsula's land development came down to me when as a lad I heard it from Mr. Hall, a farmer whose family had watched the boom unfold from their farm on Granville Avenue in West Saanich. So as already mentioned, developers seeing Saanich Peninsula as a kind of apple in the Garden of Eden, ready to be plucked, plucked away. 
According to Mr. Hull, much of the peninsula ended up being subdivided into 50-foot lots. Since land speculation was often more profitable than farming, many of the farmers probably were glad to sell it off to the developers. The resulting subdivisions initially were very likely not given property markers, the lots marked out only on paper, which might explain why the west end of Hastings Street stops abruptly and looks down into the valley from the top of a steep cliff, as does the east end of Charlton Road a half mile away. Fields of farmlands in those days were, like they are nowadays, easily subdivided and easy to service with water mains and the like. No rocky outcrops needing blasting or reworking uh, of, elephant, of elevation differences, just easy digging. Moreover, often the easiest of all farmlands for subdividing were and are situated on floodplains. Somewhere under that uh, water is uh, the railway. Uh, somewhere down about a foot or so under water. One might wonder how the interurban would get through, being as how electricity and water don't like each other much. The solution to the problem involved the maintenance vehicle and a number of construction flat cars at the appointed stopping point on the, for the streetcar, the water's edge, the contact with the electrical overhead wire would be taken down, the streetcar pushed through the floods by the line of flat cars pushed by the maintenance vehicle, and reconnected on the far side. On the return trip, the procedure would be reversed, and flat cars being sent to fetch, fetch back the streetcar. Of course, as you can see, any house built in the summertime on one of those lots would be a houseboat by Christmas. Average winter depth of water on any of the floodplains was and is one foot. The reason is more the reason it is more than a foot here is that according to the first hand viewers at the time, a farmer had dammed up the local river, the Colquitts, for irrigation purposes, thereby raising the tide, as it were. The problem was solved, I heard, when one of the affected homeowners, armed with dynamite, removed the offending obstruction one dark night. <laughs> this adventure probably took place long after the rail had been abandoned all year. In any case, by the time any purchaser might have arrived at the recently completed Colquitt Station, say, within walking distance of his hurriedly purchased home site, the property would already have gone back to the municipality for taxes owed. Eventually, those tax sales would give back the land to the farmers for more mere pennies from their windfall they had received for selling the land in the first place. Well, it went around, went around, as it were. This situation called the, spelled the end of the Saanich line. Without a construction boom on a new subdivision, a subdivision out on the peninsula, there'd be no additional riders. In fact, few people living beyond, beyond Victoria's boundary near Dublin Road had used the line. Only those living, say, in the Marigold subdivision, those above high water, of course, found the service convenient. People like my mother as a child, riding along with her mother, from their house on Grange Road. But even they were cut off from service when the line was abandoned in 1924, from Deep Cove all the way back to the city boundary near Duplin. BC Electric had misjudged the need for that streetcar service. They also misjudged, or hadn't paid attention to, that upstart automaker, Henry Ford. Uh, photo number, please. 
Yeah, yes. And the next one, please. That shows the intersection with the train and Marigold Road. Although not a truck maker or bus manufacturer, Ford's huge marketing of Model T's ended up on city streets and was giving a clear indication that street rail, street rail traffic was not going to be invited along with the ride. The rest of the company's legacy, the streetcar network, the electrical power grid, and the coal gas network faced trouble ahead. In fact, the last streetcar ran at the last trip on soon to disappear rails in 1947. I remember the newspaper article. It exuded a feeling of relief, a freedom at last from those doggone streetcars getting in the way of legitimate automobile traffic. I feel today there is the same public attitude towards Victoria's horse-drawn carriages, with people fretting and hoping for the day when they too can relax and whiz down Government Street un unimpeded in their super pickup trucks. <clears throat> the Sanix line is long gone, disappearing nearly a century ago, along with the name BC Electric. But not forgotten, names and physical locations from the railway days persist. Communities still have names common to stations on the line. Marigold and Colquitt are examples. Incidentally, the eventuality of the astrophysical observatory being built on Little Sandwich Mountain had been in doubt, since the man responsible for choosing the site, Chief Astronomer John Plaskett, actually preferred Mount Newton. Out, out Sydney way, further away from the distracting, distracting lights of the city. Unfortunately for Plaskett, there was no local electrical power source near Mount Newton to power the electric motors for opening and turning the big metal roof and adjusting the telescope. Little Sandwich Mountain, on the other hand, had a railway running right along the base of the mountain an electric railway. The decision was thereby made for Plaskett. A power line could be, and was, run up straight up on Little Sandwich Mountain, and still runs up there today. A final reminder about names. Uh, there were only three trestles large enough to be considered nameable, obviously as first, second, or third First trestle crossed a low valley like depression behind the Wilkinson Road Jail, just north of Interurban's intersection with North Road. Second trestle crossed a similar low area at the intersection of Interurban and Allen's Road before you reach the Camosun campus. Third trestle, third trestle joined the two fluffs, <laughs> bluffs either side of the flatland of Viaduct Avenue. In my youth, we always referred to the bog itself as Third Trestle. As the seven-year-old, upon hearing the flooded land was called Third Trestle, I was at a loss to what a trestle might mean. The annual flooding of the bog made the one of the peninsula's prime skating ponds. Alas, like the end of this Sanitz line, the interurban as we call it, the skating on third trestle was also ended. The last time I saw ice there was a year, maybe 20 years ago, when some yahoo drove his pickup out onto the ice. I suspect he, he had to wait for spring thaw and planting season to retrieve it from where it crashed through the ice. Regardless of its early demise, however, the Sanitz line a street li streetcar rather than a real life train hauled by a smoky locomotive still stands as a model for what we should be doing today, rebuilding our railways. A time for everything. A time to reflect on un unimportant decisions. Okay, another. For the Brentwood Hotel, and apparently it was situated very close to the line out in Central Saanich. 
Oh, another one in the sand. Moving on. Okay, interurban at Burnside. Um, that intersection is still the same. If you see a shadow on the right-hand side there, I think that's one of the pillars of the, the road, the, the train bridge for the CNR that went across there. Um, yes. I think this is a work train, and the, the car is a uh, pusher train for the for the co accommodation people for in the other one. It would have been probably the one that pushed the cars through the, the flood uh, out in Saanich. One more. This is an observation car similar to the ones taking excursions to Gorge Park in the old days. I figured none, figured none were used on the uh, interurban because no one would want to <coughs> ride all the way to town on an open car on a cold summer morning. And that's it for me. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ron, for at such an informative talk. And I know that if any of you have questions <coughs> of, the, of Ron's presentation, there will be a time after the program for us to do this. So thanks again. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker who will be speaking on the VNS, Brian Polson. And for anyone who's lived in Saanich for any period of time will know the Polson name. It's a large family. And I'm very grateful that <clears throat> Brian has agreed to come to talk to us about the BNS. Brian Polson. My name's Brian Polson and uh, our family, we, they came out from Manitoba in 1912 and left Victoria and got on the VNS and rode out to Keating and got off at Young's Crossing. That's VNS and Keating Crossroad there, Butler's store. And the, where the co-op is now, that was all Butler's property. And then they got off there and with their belongings on their back and walked down to Martindale, pitched a tent, and that's where we've been ever since. But, uh, Harold Looney, he brought the, bought the property later on. That was Looney Brothers that moved the, tri the telescope up the hill. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right. So anyways, uh, there was eight more kids born down there. There was five on the train coming out. So there was 13 of us. We're a pretty big family in Saanich. I guess there was, there was 47 grandchildren. Hmm. I'm the second one left now, the oldest. And the rest are all gone. So all the there's still an aunt left my dad's youngest sister she's still alive but she's not with it but anyways we've been here a while but anyways they took my thunder away on the the market because we had a stall down there too yeah they used to go in with a horse and wagon down glanford and all the way in the, twice a week wednesdays and saturdays Melina's folks were there and Rini's. Her, you're talking about Hills Range, that's yes. part of Rini's yes. family. Yeah. And uh, no, we've been around for a while, but anyway, so I'll get on with this thing. And the Saanich Peninsula was mostly primal forest in those days and with just a few farms where clearings had been made by hardy pioneers. The Brether brothers that started a sawmill at Sydney and also organized the township. The only real contact with the outside world was by the steamer Isabel that sailed from Victoria on Tuesdays for Comox. It was obvious that a railway was needed to get farm produce and firewood to Victoria quickly and cheaply, not to mention a breath of lumber. The second attempt was successful in persuading the city fathers and the province to guarantee the interest on a bond issue for 25 years. Eventually, the voters thought it was a good thing too and voted three to one in favor on July the 20th, 1892. 
One of the conditions was the contractor would be fined $10 a day for each Oriental employed on construction. Oh, that's something else. The survey for the right-of-way was started at once and was completed in early October, or so thought. In finding the best route, the surveyors had missed all the settled areas. The other two train tracks, they got the best land. They got the best flatter area than what the VNS did. Mm -hmm. So, and then the amended survey had some pretty steep grades. From Royal Oak, it skirted the west side of Elk Lake and Beaver before going through Keating and Saniston and then along the shore of Basin Bay to Sydney. The first Loki arrived and was promptly put to work laying track from Sydney and by January of 94 they were close to the city. The line was eventually finished by the following March at a cost of $315,938. And a few cents. The Victoria and Sydney Railway was soon to be a boon to the farmers. These were two passenger trains a day each way. Their trip took 55 minutes and cost four bits, 50 cents. <laughs> Needless to say, the little wood burning train was duped the Cordwood Limited. It even stopped where it pleased, and there is a story that the train once waited while some cows were rounded up and milked. No wonder it was sometimes two hours late. The line never had a dispatcher, it ran on a telephone. The Cordwood Limited got some competition in 1912 when the BC Electric Railway started to build the interurban line out from into the sticks. Misery Loves Company, and in late 1913, another competitor sh shoved his oar in, and when the Canadian Northern Railway came along with a line to Patricia Bay. The bad weather of 1916 really socked in the railways. A big snow drift at Saniston closed down the VNS for eight days until they finally made a makeshift plow to clear the track. Eventually time ran out for the little railway and the notice came to quit and on April the 30th, 1919, the Cordwood Limited ran for the last time and the company went into bankruptcy. So anyways, now we get, here's the map up here and this part here, this is where they surveyed originally and you can, see the, you can see the piling, they drew, they drove piles in there and they were going to cut across that bay in the lake. Can you imagine what would happen if they ever had a wreck? Well, man, everything was in the water. And so they made them, they stopped all work, and laid everybody off when they were grading the track up further on the lake there, and come back through. They had to make them put rock cuts through there. there was, you can see the three rock cuts on the backside. And then they were going to come down through Beaver Lake and right across the lake through into Colquitt's Creek. So they made them all stop and start again and come back through the back. They didn't like that. But it cost them a bit of money. So anyways, the next picture there. Okay, that's the Prairie Inn. A fellow by the name of Simpson, he built the first one. And then later on it burnt down, so they, they put this one up. And across here, across the road from this way, like south, across Mount Newton. That's Mount Newton Crossroad going up there beside it. And East Sanus Road come along in front here. But across the south end, there was a little store there. And back further, we get into some pictures. Keep going there on the... Okay, this is the back of the Elk Lake, yeah. So, so Elk Lake crossing here. Yeah, that's that one. There was two, the two tracks passed there so they could one train going north and one coming south so they could pass each other and just past there a little bit south of that there was an old roller rink I don't know any people can remember it there that was that opened in 41 during the war and closed again in 45 it only lasted four years but yeah, part of the concrete. Yeah, it is there because yeah, I used to ride my horse around the lake because I lived at Elk Lake. 
all my life, and uh, I used to ride my horse right around on Brooklyn Road and round through Beaver Lake and that, right, right around the place, but it was uh, quite a deal. The lake come up, they dammed up the Caucus Creek, and the lake come up one winter, and part of the roller rink went in the water, so that ended that roller rink. But uh, anyways, uh, we'll carry on with that. Then Saniston, here, you've got the Saniston pictures there? Well, that's still at Elk Lake at one cro at the crossing where they passed each other. Yeah. Now, see that the little alleyway there? That's south of Caltra. Well, that's going towards the Prairie Inn. And this is the VNS on the bottom side. Where, you know where Mitchell's farm is down the bottom on East Sanders Road? Well, that comes up through there, through a cut there, because it was too steep to come up the first part of VNS coming south. And so that's just about at Stelly's Road on this end, and the coming up from Mitchell's on the other end there. And then we got, uh, let's see the next one there. No. Oh, Loke Hotel, I think. Yeah. And so that's where the train used to, they couldn't get up the hill off, coming up off of Burgess or Burgess Farm there. Couldn't get up there, so a lot of guys used to get off and walk up the hotel and have a couple of pints waiting for the train to come up. <laughs> they couldn't get up there. So that's the only reason they made it, because they weren't on it. So, the anyways, we'll get to the next one there. And there's some, here is the, uh, the rural house, they called it. Well, down south of the Prairie Inn, there's, that was down a little bit south, clo close to a Hem Street store, and by the little church on Caltra. Well, so there's four families lived in there. And there was the Turgooses, the Crawfords, the Fergusons, and uh, what was the other ones? Not the Thompsons. But anyways, Fergusons built it, and they built a house down in Martindale too. But they. Uh, Old uh, Uncle John Ferguson, he used to stay in it, and this is, oh, when it burnt down, that was all still Saanich. It wasn't so, it wasn't Central Saanich yet. And so it burnt down one night. Well, Mr. Crawford, I don't know if you remember Skip Crawford, anybody in here? Well, his dad was working in the shipyards, and he'd come home and used to stop and stoke up the fire for the old fella, keep him warm, and he went home, and then Rashley's, where the Saniston station was, Rash, that was in Rashley's property across the road. Well, that place burnt down, and so Rashley ran up and got Mr. Crawford to go down. Well, it's too late. The old Uncle, Uncle John was gone. But the fellow that found him was Eric Wellwell, and he was a sergeant in the Saniston Police Force, and he was the guy that got him out of there, but he didn't get him out. He was dead, but Later, so that's a little bit of history from the police force, was, which here at Royal Oak, and they used to have to go out there, went to Mount Newton just about. And, uh, oh, see, this is the wreck at Elk Lake. Now, when they had a wreck there, they put, put it off the track. That happened quite a few times. It used to come down the hill and throw Beaver Lake, and it would spread the tracks. And, They'd have to jack them all up again and get them off. And, uh, boy, there's another little thing there. That thing, all that, that's the waiting station at Brookley Road. And where the two tracks, they had quite a place there for, that was a station. One person could fit in there. And a milk, couple, <laughs> a couple of milk cans. And, and, and this is, they moved the station, that station on the other side, that's V&S and Keating. That, and that station over there, that's where the fruit shed is today, the old fruit shed. Well, the track come right through the building. You can see the horses in the middle there, that's where the track went. But they moved that station from Royal Oak to, to Keating. But man, they thought it was only going to take a little while to get out there. It took all day. But they forgot when they made the right away, cleared the right away, they never cleared it wide enough. The guy says, well, we'll 
skimp a little bit here and they took six inches off each side and it was supposed to be 12 feet, they ended up with 11. Well, they couldn't get the thing out there. They loaded it on a flat car and then it couldn't go by. They had to finish cutting the stumps off and the telephone poles and everything. It took them all day to move it about five miles. <laughs> so anyway, that was a little bit of a good story there. And that's the old uh, trestle at Snyder's Ravine that was just up from Darrell's place there on Pipeline Road. And this other one here, that's on Agnes Street. That's the one you showed, uh, Richard, mm -hmm. on uh, yes. Glanford, off of Glanford. That's Agnes and Glanford, oh, from Rogers, Rogers Farm. That trestle was 40 feet high. That was that was the Snyder's Ravine. That's just before you get to Arnold Goyet's place. Where is that again? On Pipeline Road. Oh. It's down in that dip going down there. That's where that is. Oh. And the next one up there and there somewhere. And this one here is the letter for the sewer that went across from uh, the we're dumping it on the track. So you can imagine when they were going to put it through the lake to, to why they diverted it around. The mayor, I think the mayor of, I guess it was Sydney and somebody else, they got a boat and they rowed around and they found the pilings and so they made them pull it all out and re-survey re, uh, it. The, well, that's the station at Royal Oak, okay. Yeah, before they moved it out to the Keating, I think. Yeah. Those uh, crossings where the track went at uh, Basin Bay, there were three crossings right in the same spot. They're right about where that overpass is now, mm -hmm. that thing there. That was where the three crossings went across there. The inner urban went out through Wallace Drive across Mabers Flats there and across Stelly's and it ended up at Sanderson but they had a spur at Sanderson right in front of the PI well the VNS had to take the track from Sydney for the interurban and put an extra spur in there to get it over to them and they didn't like that and the yeah. competition was coming in and they had to yeah. supply them yeah. and there was quite a deal but there were three trains all crossed in there that's Roger's house up looking towards Royal Oak or looking towards uh, the Agnes Street there. You can see this little house down in the center. Well, that's on Agnes Street, that one you showed before. And you can see the train coming across on the back side there. Yeah. I don't think. So. Yeah, there, there it is now, yeah. Here. Well, that up top there, and that little house is on, that's Roger's house. Right. Yeah. Over here? Yeah, down below a little bit more. Right yeah, right there. That's that's on Agnes Street. And you can see the train coming through on the up over further? Here? Over here? Yeah. There's a height of land there. That does be Christmas Hill, I think. Christmas Hill, and yeah. we've got another. That'd be Mount Tommy or Tommy. Mount Doug. Oh, Doug, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty big. Yeah. Well, I think that's about all I got. So. Brian, thank you very much for. Thank you very much, Brian. And now I'd like to introduce to you Peter Goddard. Who, when I was a boy scout, attending the scout hall down the road here, Peter was part of that experience. And we're <clears throat> grateful uh, for Peter's, as a founding member of this organization, has been a very strong supporter, and as a member of St. Michael's Anglican Church has enabled us to meet in this church hall for our meetings. It is a church hall that I know some of you 
attended Sunday school here many years ago. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you <clears throat> Peter Goddard, who will speak on the CNN Railroad in our peninsula. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Um, this story is about the Canadian Northern Pacific Railway. Just prior to the First World War, Victoria's population and industry were growing to the point where supplies and goods, mostly brought by a lot, were brought by the CPR passenger steamers from Vancouver to Victoria. Maybe the first, you know, okay, and were and were able to keep up with the, the amount needed. It was proposed that the rail line would bring freight from the mainland by a freight car, freight car barge to Pat Bay, then on to Victoria. A terminus was built at Pat Bay, where the present Ocean Sciences building is now. The rail line would come across land now the Pat Bay Airport, crossing the interurban and VNS tracks near Sydney. The line would have a spare spur line into Sydney, where the Sydney lumber mill was. The line would follow the level lands along the coastline of Saanich, which is now Lockside Road and Trail. On the east side of East Saniston, where the Mount Newton Road is, an adjustment to the route would be made to to the west to go around the Saniston Native Reserve and back, then go back down through the Keating Valley, then pass close to Clover Bay, southward through the Blenkinsop Valley, where the trestle was needed to get over B B uh, Blenkinsop Lake. The west, and then westward through South Saanich, crossing over Quadra Street, then on towards Victoria over another, another trestle to get over the lands, the lowlands of Swan Lake, continuing past the present Saanich Municipal Hall through a cut which we now call Ravine Way, leading to another trestle called the Selkirk and over the Gorge Waterway and to the west end of Bay Street Bridge, where a freight yard would be located to connect to the Victoria and Nanaimo Railroad and then carry on with a, a line to Souk. They had a line out to Souk also. On the map it shows a triangular, on the map, what, through the map I've had, it shows two triangular sections of track near Victoria, one near Victoria and one at Pat Bay. Those were to enable the engines to turn around by turning up one leg of the track and back down onto the track again to get their engine facing the other way and they could pull the train and the engine could come back to Victoria. At that same time, the engines would push the freight cars back onto the rail ferry before proceeding to Victoria. And there were four B that with with the First World War, construction was delayed. Grading the line took fourteen months. Then completion was not made until late nineteen seventeen. The first train was an excursion car to travel from Victoria to Pat Bay. The car came from Steve, the car barge came from Steveston, where a connection to the mainland rail lines could be made. The CN, it was now the CNR, the best through BC to Edmonton and then across the, to the east coast of Canada. Starting in 1917, freight from eastern Canada made its way to Victoria. The lumber mill at Sydney produced 400 carloads a year for the Victoria and mainland points. Its, its advertisements promoted lumber of all sizes were available. One could get beams 30 inches by 30 inches square by 60 feet long. Try that now on the trees you got. You need a lot of glue, I think. <laughs> um, another customer, the Basin Bay Brick and tile plant near the Dominion Experimental Farm produced bricks for many buildings constructed in Victoria along with it and uh, besides that there was the Baker Brick and Tile Factory which, which is where the Mayfair Mall is but they moved their bricks by the BNS line. All three Peninsula Railways had excursion trains. Before the automobile came available, Cordova Bay was a popular destination point for the now CNR trains passengers. Its sandy beaches were a big draw for weekend picnics, camping, and summer cabins. 
the cost of the rail tra the traveling on this rail line was three cents a mile. Victoria to Coeur Bay was 25 cents. To go all the way through to Pat Bay was 60 cents one way. And if you were to return, it would cost two cents a mile to come back. So it was five cents return trip for the whole thing. <laughs> McMorrins had the facilities to help accommodate those who came by train. There were no no road no road access to Cudover Bay, not directly to Cudover Bay. It came around by the backside of Mount Douglas out after it gone through Oak Bay, so it was a long way around. So the railroad was the main way of getting people out that way. Farmers would would use the railway to get farm products to town. One of these farms was named Halliburton. It was a young lady's school that oriented to become farm wives. There were many bachelors and a, a shortage of eligible girls in BC for these bachelors. So Miss Bainbridge Smith started the school. She was a principal and the farm produced fruit and vegetables, dairy pro products for market. Halliburton Road was extended through the bush down the to Kurova Bay Road to make a connection with a train to get product to town. This school was operation from 1918 to 1938. The McMoran boys during the 1920s tell of how they would go for rides on the hand car between Halliburton and their place. As the automobile became more prevalent, people would, would drive their cars from Victoria to Sydney along the trails, gradually caused the demise of the railways passenger service. The CNR line closed in 1935 when the car barge moved its terminal to Victoria, so the line was no longer needed. The line was dismantled from Pat Bay to near Quadra Street, maintaining service to the Borden Mercantile f Feed Mill. That portion of the line was discontinued in early 1990s. Thus ends the railway systems through Saanich Peninsula. Since then, the Pat Bay portion of the line is now covered by the Pat, uh, the Pat Bay International Airport, which was started in 1938, when the first sod was turned for the airport, and in 1939, war having been declared, the airport was taken over by the RCAF to be used for Canadian pilot training, also by the Royal Air Force for their air defense programs. Prior to the Pat Bay Airport, we used the um, fields at well, Lansdowne, Lansdowne, where Lansdowne School is, that's where the, that used to be the airport prior to Pat Bay. In 1948, when it went to, well, when I went to grade six at the new Cordova Bay School to get there, we would walk down the trails through the bush that became, and they later, that, those trails later became Claremont Avenue to Cordova Bay Road. And then at Lockside, we would walk along the remaining railway ties that, that passed by the school. By 1950, the, these, were, these were gone and replaced by the fabulous Lockside Drive and Trail System that, is, that so many people now enjoy suit to Sydney today. That's about all I have on the Lockside. I don't, there was a few pictures trying to get through, but that was, that was the uh, excursion car. That they, they borrowed it from the VNS, the same car to both railways, apparently. I could go on further, but I think we've had enough here for today, but um, there is the write-up that was another version of what we all just did, but we, I think we've covered it all pretty well just on our own here. But I've got a, I've got an old railway engine here, at least a clock, it's a, it's a clock, an alarm clock, and so I get it set to the right time here. Okay, imagine you're waking up to this. So much for that. Anyway, imagine having that for a wake up. The, um, the person who gave me that, he had two sons who, who could not wake up in the morning. So he got this clock and he put it in the, their room and they had to get up to shut it off. And that was, that was a bit much. Anyway, so that's all I have to say about it. There's a few other pictures here, but that's the, that's a different trestle.
to take any further questions or anything, we'll be pleased to try and answer them. But I didn't have a lot of information on the lockside train. The other, they're, it's well documented on the other two, but that one sort of went by the wayside. We've printed off a bunch of brochures here, or stories about the two rail, uh, the railroads. If there's there's 20 copies there, so if anybody will be interested, please take one. And the other one is a copy of the original, the opening of the uh, Interurban Railroad. It's a, it was a document came out. The original one had um, that's a reprint, so it doesn't. Half on the back and some great photos. Please help yourself. Thank you very much. And we have assorted whistles here. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend our thanks. First of all, to our three speakers who will entertain questions from you following in a few minutes. And I would like to thank Paul Taylor for his technical assistance, Daryl Foster for recording our programs for our blog, and our President Enid and Secretary Treasurer Heather Smith for their role Notice the hats. And those of you that, are res that were responsible for our wonderful refreshments that we're going to enjoy following a question period. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>